Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, it's been quite a weekend <laughs> of events here in California. So thanks very much, everyone, for, for taking the time to be here um, and for really recognizing how important this issue is that we're going to be talking about today around immigrant communities and how we can do a better job across the state and also locally to support immigrant communities. Uh, my name is Carolyn Wang Kong, and I am the Chief Program Director of Blue Shield of California Foundation. Um, we've been a very proud partner to Kaiser Family Foundation in doing a lot of this work that you'll be hearing about today. So a little bit about us uh, and our foundation. A little over two years ago, we made a shift in our strategic priorities at Blue Shield of California Foundation, um, which was really, we changed our mission statement. And, and we, we updated our mission to really be around making California the healthiest state in the nation and ending domestic violence. Those are our two key issue areas that are increasingly becoming more integrated in terms of how health um, can drive violence prevention and vice versa. This mission is really rooted in the belief that healthy communities are one that are safe, supportive, and have opportunity for everyone, right? And we have really come to believe that those are really the protective factors that can actually inoculate communities against violence and promote good health. So they're pretty critical to us. Just as we were making this shift a couple of years ago towards more of this prevention space um, that really required us to get underneath what was driving poor health and violence, really required us to look at the root causes of these things, um, the 2016 election happened. And uh, what that meant was we knew, just as I'm sure many of you in the room knew, that there were going to be policies and proposals that would come from the federal level that would very likely destabilize our communities, and specifically looking, risking the health, safety, and economic stability of our communities, and, to, um, and in particular for immigrant families as well. So as a health funder, um, these types of threats, right, are, are unacceptable. They basically compromise everything I just mentioned in terms of what the protective factors are around safety and feeling supported and having opportunity, right? Especially threats like public charge. Public charge, which um, is something that we will be talking about today. Uh, in the short term, the impacts are the chilling effect, right? How many folks have heard of the chilling effect around public charge, right? And so the idea being here, of course, that folks who are impacted by the rule and even folks who are not impacted by the rule are changing their behavior in terms of whether or not they seek health care services, whether or not they sign up for benefits, um, CalFresh benefits, other public benefits that, can, that really help to stabilize you in your life. In the short term, um, you know, we see, of course, as a health funder, we see folks not going to community health services, community health centers for care. We also see domestic violence victims and survivors not seeking help because they don't feel safe seeking help for the harm that they're experiencing. We also know that short-term impacts can turn into long-term impacts, right? Um, and so for us, what we see is actually, if you're not able to access healthcare services, that can actually impact your ability to work, right? And if you're not able to work, that can actually drive your family deeper into poverty. And for all of us, as we think about the connections here, right, folks that grow up in poverty are much more likely to grow up to not have um, access to all of those protective factors that we mentioned. Um, the other angle to this, too, is, is and, and what we'll talk about today as well, is that this is not just an us versus them issue. When we talk about our economy, California as a state contributes what, one and a half times to the GDP as any other state. So when you talk about impacting the health of our communities, you're talking about impacting the workforce of our communities and our contribution. And so that becomes much more of an us issue altogether, right, a shared issue. So. The long-term impacts that we're also really concerned about at Blue Shield of California is that we have started to increasingly take a two-generation frame to our work and look at our work from a two-generation perspective, right? How do exposures or harms that are happening to parents impact children, right? And so what we're even more concerned about with a lot of the anti-immigrant policies that have been put forth is this idea of stress and trauma that are being experienced by our kids. And in the state of California, Roughly half of the children in the state 
have a parent who is an immigrant, half of our children in California. Um, and so we are particularly concerned about the impact to their life trajectories as we think about now through these rules, right, we've compromised their ability to access health care, potentially force them to live in deeper poverty than they have been, increase the toxic stress that they're facing, and so we've essentially stacked the deck against our kids here in California. Um, but there's good news. There's good news, and we're going to hear some of that good news today. Um, there's good news in that we are California, and we have very strong leadership in our state that really recognizes and holds the values of creating a healthy state for all. And so today we have a really exciting lineup of speakers. The one bit of bad news that I have to deliver is that Secretary Mark Galley could not be with us this morning. Um, for those of you who've been paying attention and looking outside, we have areas of our state that are on fire again. Um, and so the Secretary and his team are in the Sonoma area really tending to the needs of those communities at this moment. So unfortunately couldn't be able to join us today. But I do want to lift up a few of the themes that he was going to be touching on. Um, you know, one of the things that I was going to say was to really thank him for being here because the strength of being present and the strength is it's a symbol of support for our work, but it's also a symbol of willingness to collaborate, right? And that's something that the state has been really, really um, driving is this need to really work hand in hand with trusted partners. And so that's something that they're really focusing on. Um, and I mentioned the risks around the chilling effect, that's not stopping our state, right, from expanding things like Medi-Cal and things like CalFresh benefits and expanding legal services as well. Um, and so the focus for all of us today is really about, in light of these threats, how do we not lose ground? How do we not lose ground as it relates to health, as it relates to safety and supports and opportunity for all? So this morning, um, we have a really impressive lineup of speakers. Um, that will be joining us today. So we're gonna start with um, Samantha Artiga from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Samantha is the Associate Director of the Disparities Program, or no, the Director of the Disparities Program, Associate Director of the Program on Medicaid there at Kaiser Family Foundation. And they've been a critical partner to us in doing a lot of the research around the needs of local immigrant families, as well as the um, really innovative solutions that communities have come together to around to support families. And so you'll hear some of that research today. Um, and then we're going to move over to our very impressive panel um, who will share their reactions to the research and also give us that hope, right, around what are the paths forward? What are the strengths that we have to build on? Um, and so starting from the far right with Carmela, um, Carmela Castellano Garcia is the president and CEO of the California Primary Care Association, which is the association that um, really is the umbrella organization for, is it 1,700 community health centers now in California? Um, who And these are the really the first line of defense, right, in terms of safety net facilities for many vulnerable communities in California. So thank you, Carmela, for being here. In the middle, we have Kathy Senderling McDonald, who's the Deputy Executive Director for the County Welfare Directors Association of California, which is the association that oversees all of the human services directors across of our state. Um, and Kathy's gonna be sharing some really promising examples uh, from a specific counties in California around what the welfare directors and human services directors are doing in partnership, often with other agencies as well. And then lastly, on the left, my left, your right, um, Myra Alvarez is the, uh, the president of the Children's Partnership, which is an organization who, at the foundation, we've been really honored to partner with. Um, they've worked on a whole host of issues related to children's well-being, whether it be around enrollment and healthcare coverage, to census, to protection against public charge and immigration. And so we're really grateful for Myra to be here. Myra is also recently appointed to the state's first five commission, so we're very pleased to have her uh, represented there as well. So how we're gonna structure this is I will pass it over to Samantha. She'll go over um, the research findings and then we'll have some open questions with our panelists to have them react to the findings and then we'll open it up for Q&A as well amongst the audience. So, here you go. Thanks so much, Carolyn, for that great setup and thanks again to all of you for joining us today. Um, as Carolyn mentioned, uh, today I'm going to be presenting findings from a new report uh, that we are releasing today and is now available on our website at uh, www.kff.org. 
Um, and it really highlights perspectives from both families, but also from a broad range of service providers across sectors about how the current immigration policy environment is affecting families, um, but also how local organizations and communities are responding to family needs, and also touches on what providers view as really the priorities um, for addressing family needs um, moving forward. So before I jump into the report's findings, I think it's really helpful to kind of step back and think about how families are being affected by policy change. Um, and this uh, image gives us a sense of some of the um, policy changes that have gone into place since the Trump administration took office. So as Carolyn raised, one of the key issues um, that recently has been a focus has been public charge policy. But I think it's important to recognize that there really are a broad range of other policies that have also impacted families. Um, that are having effects, and these policies really fall into several buckets. One is really about restricting immigration into the U.S. The second is really about enhancing interior immigration enforcement. And the third, mostly reflective in the public charge policy, is really about limiting access to public programs for immigrant families. So in terms of the research that I'll be presenting today, um, within this uh, policy environment and all that change, we undertook a project that was conducted over the summer to understand its impact, again, through the perspectives of both families and service providers. So we conducted a series of interviews as well as two policy roundtable discussions with service providers across sectors, so health, legal services, education. We also had local officials um, as part of those conversations. And then we paired that with focus groups with um, parents in immigrant families. And all this work was conducted in the San Francisco Bay Area and San Diego and was supported by the Blue Shield of California Foundation. And we're really grateful for them um, making that work possible. So the first major finding I want to highlight from the project was that we continue to hear, consistent with um, work we've been doing over the past few years on this topic, is how growing fears and uncertainties um, are negatively affecting families as well as increasing pressures on local communities. Um, we heard from both families and service providers about sharp increases in mental health needs, problems such as depression and anxiety, both among um, adults but as also children in the families. Um, service providers also pointed to growing economic pressures on families. Um, for example, um, families as well as service providers noted that they have more limited job options available in the current environment and some expressed fears about going to work or seeking work and you can see some of that expressed directly in um, providers and families' own words on the slide. Um, as Carolyn referenced in her opening, um, pro providers were really uniformly concerned about um, the long-term consequences of this environment on both the physical and mental health of families. They also pointed to the potential losses due to unrealized potential, particularly among the youth in families. Um, for example, children no longer performing as well in school academically, um, older children not really able to participate in um, actions like education and um, other activities to further themselves because they're needing um, to take on different roles within their families. But aside from the family impacts, um, which have been well documented, I think, over the past few years, we also uh, really heard about the growing pressures on service providers and the broader local communities. Um, in particular, we heard consistently that many service providers are really experiencing vicarious or secondary trauma and burnout um, from serving families in this complex environment, particularly because many of those providers come from shared backgrounds and experiences of the families they're serving and may also be directly experiencing some of the challenges um, that families are experiencing as well. 
Um, they also noted that doing their jobs has just become so complex and challenging, particularly legal services providers. Um, because policy is constantly changing, it's really hard for them to feel, stay up to date on the current environment and to really feel certain and comfortable in the advice um, that they're providing to families. So we did hear directly from families and um, service providers that families are decreasing use of programs and services due to fears. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that public charge certainly has a key role in this, but families have a broad range of fears and concerns about using public programs and services, including potentially putting undocumented family members at risk, um, jeopardizing the ability of themselves or another family member to get a green card or adjust status in the future. Um, potentially negatively impacting their ability to sponsor other relatives to come over in the future, um, and some fears and concerns that they may have to pay be back benefits at some time. So there's not just a single fear that families are experiencing, uh, they're really multiple fears. And the public charge um, regulation, as well as recent changes to housing assistance policy, which would limit housing assistance for mixed status um, families, have really just amplified and ramped up those fears. And also um, made families feel uncertain about what potential future policy changes um, could happen. So they, they worry that other changes could happen in the future that would also negatively impact them. Um, we specifically heard about families disenrolling from Medi-Cal or Medicaid um, for themselves as well as their children and also choosing not to renew coverage or um, declining to enroll in coverage despite being eligible. Um, but we also heard about these disenrollment and choosing not to enroll effects spreading much more broadly to other programs and services, including programs like WIC that are not named in the public charge rule, and um, as noted, much more broadly across populations than those directly affected by the rule, for example, um, extending to citizen children and immigrant families. Um, and providers are very concerned about the health and economic impacts of this decreased program use. Um, again, it increases economic pressure on families if they're receiving less support. In particular, pro providers also really pointed to concerns about pregnant women putting off or delaying prenatal care and really the significant potential um, negative health uh, consequences of that. So, but. In this project, we really wanted to push beyond just um, focusing on the challenges and um, problems to really begin to explore and document how local organizations and communities are responding to address those needs and highlight in particular successful strategies and approaches that have emerged. Um, and one of the core strategies that we heard about in the, both the San Francisco Bay Area and San Diego was really about strengthening existing or creating new um, cross-sector partnerships or relationships. For example, um, pairing healthcare and legal services together. Um, a legal services provider bringing on a social worker who can really help with case management and navigation for a family. Um, consistent with this approach, we also heard a lot about efforts to expand and enhance mental health capacity in other sectors. For example, training pediatricians or primary care providers to be better able to conduct regular mental health screenings and do some basic mental health treatment, really kind of expanding their scope of practice in that area. Um, providers also pointed to uh, strategies to expand services and supports directly in the schools and they noted that to the extent it's possible to make those services available in the schools, it really helps reduce barriers to accessing services um, and that schools really remain a trusted place for many families. Um, Providers stressed the growing importance of the role of trusted individuals and organizations. Um, there really are few of those that families trust um, in the current environment, but some that really emerged were churches, schools, charities, 
um, and to some degree um, healthcare providers as well. And so they really stress the importance of utilizing those trusted individuals and organizations um, to communicate with families and provide an avenue to help connect them to services. Finally, they emphasized that uh, local and state leadership and policies really do make a difference. Um, for example, they referenced the sanctuary state and city um, rules which help make families feel safe and protected in their environments. They also really pointed to the governor's leadership on this issue, noting that um, it's not only been symbolic, but has been followed through with funding um, and actions to really support families. So looking ahead to the future, providers really were focused on the need for ongoing integration and coordination of services across sectors as a key priority. Um, and they really emphasized the importance of finding ways to make that um, coordination and integration and these relationships sustainable over time, which I think is really the key here. Um, one major gap that they really highlighted is the lack of sufficient mental health and legal services capacity to address current family needs. Um, and here they noted that we need both short-term um, strategies to help fill those gaps. For example, taking an inventory of all the services that are available in a local area to be able to better connect families to resources that are there, but also looking ahead to the longer term about how do we increase the supply of these providers and particularly increase the supply of providers that can provide linguistically and culturally appropriate care uh, because right now there's a real lack of um, providers that can provide services in language and, um, and consistent with, um, with family needs. Um, providers pointed out that local nonprofits and local governments are really facing increased demands in the current environment, particularly as families are turning away from public programs and services. Um, many of the nonprofits really stepped in to fill gaps and needs without any readily available funding available. Um, and so providing resources to address those growing needs will be important. They also really stressed the importance of maintaining access to care for individuals um, as they disenroll from public programs and really see, saw this as instrumental for protecting against um, negative uh, consequences on health outcomes and really eroding the major progress the state has made over the years to advance health through a lot of its earlier coverage initiatives, including the expansion um, to uh, pregnant women and children regardless of status. Um, they also stressed how important outreach and education is going to be in order to get um, individuals to enroll in the new Medi-Cal expansion to young adults in this current environment where people are increasingly fearful um, about enrolling in programs and services. They also stressed that there is just a continual and ongoing need for information sharing and outreach and education to both families and service providers because the policy environment continues to shift and change. Um, and families and providers are both really seeking accurate, trusted information that they can rely on um, related to the current policy environment. Lastly, they stressed that um, it's really important to recognize the role of state and local leaders and philanthropy and um, the role they can play to both address family needs, but also to frame the public discussion and show leadership on these issues. So just in sum, I think what we really saw through this project is that the shifting um, environment is leading to increased fears and uncertainty that have wide-ranging negative effects on families, but also are in increasing pressures on service providers and local communities more broadly. Uh, the San Francisco Bay Area and San Diego communities have responded to growing family needs in many different ways um, that really center, though, on cross-sector coordination and collaboration and on enhancing services and supports that are available to families. Um, providers view this continued strengthening and um, sustainability of integration and coordination as a key priority looking ahead as well as figuring out ways to address these um, major gaps in services, particularly mental health and legal services. 
Um, there's also this ongoing need for trusted information and, um, and education about policy changes. Um, and again, I think there's a role for uh, many different actors to play in efforts moving ahead, including state and local leadership, philanthropy, and the on-the-ground organizations. And I think our panel will discuss some of those varying roles as we get into that um, discussion. Um, and then again, I think it's important to recognize the context um, that this is really key for preventing erosion of um, the advancements in health that California has achieved and also um, just protecting the health and well-being of families um, overall. And with that, I'm really excited to shift over to our panel for some reactions to the findings. Um, before we jump into discussion, Carolyn had introduced each of you briefly, but maybe if you could um, say a few words about your organization and how you've been engaged in these issues, that would be helpful. So since we started with Carmela last time, why don't we start with uh, Myra? And I think you have to hit your button. Great. Hello, good morning. Uh, huge thanks to the Kaiser Family Foundation and Samantha and Blue Shield of California Foundation for hosting this conversation and for inviting me to be a part of it. Um, I, f I feel like this, the issue of immigration enforcement and its impact on children's health has been something our team has been living and breathing since the president was elected, um, literally since the day after. Uh, and really thinking about ways in which we as ad child advocates can do the best job to represent the needs and interests of the children of California. Uh, we originally historically have been involved in ensuring that every child has access to health insurance coverage and has access to the resources and opportunities that they need to thrive. Uh, we had just seen this huge win in California with the expansion of Medi-Cal to cover undocumented children. Um, we were beginning to enroll children. We'll talk about that process when we talk a little bit later in the panel. Um, and we were out in the community uh, trying to encourage people to enroll in coverage. We have a series of community conversations that we call Let's Talk, where we go to school campuses, we offer food or we offer snacks, and families come in, and our team is on the ground talking to people about some policy changes. And as we would talk about Medi-Cal and the importance of going to the doctor and getting your preventive services, most of the questions that families in the room were asking were about immigration. Most of them were asking, is it still safe to go? Is, is it going to change our, is it going to impact our application later on? And we realized that we were doing a disservice to the children of California if we were not working on immigration policy as children's advocates. We realized that it was our responsibility to ensure that people that cared about kids, that prioritized the development of children here in California, that they considered the issue of immigration from a children's perspective. So in our work as allies in this fight for, frankly, a better country, uh, we realized we're bringing that perspective, that we can frame these issues from a child perspective and really try to widen the tent of people that have greater understanding and engagement in trying to move forward humane immigration policies that really consider the impacts on not only the intended recipient of policy changes, but the unintended recipients that are often the children of, of immigrant parents. Um, so the, for the past couple of years, we've been really working on this issue, um, frankly, in partnership with many of our immigrant rights organizations. Um, again, we recognize that as children's advocates, we hadn't been in that space before. So you want to approach this issue with humility and with um, a, a learning journey. So we partnered with the California <laughs> Immigrant Policy Center in a robust study of California families that looked at um, what are immigrant families feeling, what are they experiencing, and it was that partnership that allowed us to not only build trust with communities, but to learn ourselves about policy changes, about you know, what the immigrant rights community had been doing for decades, frankly, to try and make sure California was a better space for all children, um, and how we could be better allies. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later on, but um, since that time, we've been able to ensure that we're doing all we can to bring on traditional child advocates, educators, um, early learning community to really consider the issue of immigration from a child perspective and again, hopefully have a more united front uh, to ensure that we're moving forward uh, inclusive, humane policies across the board. Go ahead. Okay. 
Hi, I, I'm Kathy Senderling McDonald, the Deputy Director at the County Welfare Directors Association. Um, as in the introduction, we're a nonprofit. We represent all 58 county human services agencies. And a little shout out to a few county folks who are here in the room from some of our Bay Area counties today. So thank you guys for coming to support me. Um, I uh, also want to echo the thanks to the two foundations for the work that they've done and for putting this together today. I think, um, so I've been with CWDA for 19 years. and. Up until the last few years, I think our work in the immigration space was largely on the margin. We worked on DACA and you know, creating that and helping uh, roll that out and make sure that um, you know, folks, our eligibility staff, understood how that intersected with the programs such as CalWORKs, CalFresh, and Medi-Cal eligibility that they do on a day-to-day -day basis to get people enrolled. Um, but we serve one in three Californians at any given time across those programs, as well as child welfare and foster care, adult protective services, and the in-home supportive services. So over time, I think our engagement around immigration communities, issues of language, issues of access have grown and grown, and to the point where when uh, things first started to happen with the Trump administration when he took office um, and started the initial executive orders, we realized pretty quickly that we need to step up our game. And so joining some of the coalitions that I know a number in the audience are members of as well, um, and we started working on some talking points. And initially, um, you know, there were these, uh, the initial executive orders, if you recall, were not really related to human services. The public charge rumor didn't start right away. And so we were working on talking points for our staff that were like, they're there, you know, things are okay, nothing's changed, you're good, for our eligibility workers. And then bam, the public charge rumor started and they leaked the draft and we pulled back. Because we're like, we cannot say they're there. We cannot say you're OK. Because we don't know when these things are actually going to happen. So I think that's when we really got serious about starting to make those partnerships and doing some work um, uh, funded largely by the California Healthcare Foundation to pull some other folks together and say, how can we talk about this? How can we um, develop materials and a toolkit and information for our staff and for our partners that can be used locally and adapted locally? And so that's where we really got started with this. And I think we've um, gotten more and more involved. And we'll talk again about that as we go through some questions that were asked. Um, but I think we come at it from a view of ensuring um, that to the greatest extent possible we're mitigating poverty and the toxic effects, that we're thinking about trauma, and that we're thinking about the place of our programs in that larger space in the community um, related to healthcare, related to public health, that my members don't necessarily deliver on a day-to-day -day basis, but that is so intertwined. And how do we work with those trusted partners since we, the government, would like to be trusted partners, but we aren't always seen that way. So kind of that's our perspective that we bring to the conversation today. Great, thanks. Carmel? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> so pleased to be here, um, and thank you to the leadership here for um, the research and for presenting uh, and supporting this really critical topic. And um, in terms of where the community health centers are coming from on this, I've been representing the community health centers for the last 22 years. Many of you know we just had our 25th anniversary celebration last week, which I'm pretty excited about. Uh, community health centers uh, have been unified uh, as a force in the state for over two decades now. And I was just reflecting on the telephone on my way, telephone on my mobile, on the way <laughs> over here, um, with one of the leaders in the community health center world around this, which is Jane Garcia of La Clinica de la Raza. And we were reflecting back, it's a 25th uh, anniversary, not only of CPCA, but of Proposition 187, and when this state was a leader nationally in the most you know, heinous anti-immigrant initiative I could really think of. She was reminding me, remember how the, uh, the clinics were going to be uh, having to report uh, people uh, in that law, among other um, heinous provisions. And so the community health centers, um, obviously uh, the anti-immigrant climate has been a huge concern of us for decades, given that we are open door providers, nonprofit community-based clinics that now in our state are serving seven million patients and actually serving one in three individuals in the Medi-Cal program. So very um, large system, the backbone of the Medi-Cal program here, but also the backbone of primary care preventive services to the immigrant community in the state of California. Um, as open door providers, protecting uh, the rights of immigrant to access health care has been critical um, for our association, certainly these last decades. So just reflecting on Proposition 187 and remembering during that time, 
um, that the community health centers um, were really just forming their association, really coming to be a political voice. And then there was, as that effort continued, we might recall Yvette Doe versus Belshay, which was the lawsuit when Governor Pete Wilson tried to eliminate prenatal care for undocumented immigrant women, um, which actually made it through the budget process and was stopped by a lawsuit by public advocates. So this is a long time, and in that case, La Clinica de la Raza and Tiburcio Vasquez health centers were the two um, community health center plaintiffs, which at the time was a major show of courage in this state in that anti-immigrant climate to stand up and be a named plaintiff in a lawsuit challenging Pete Wilson. Um, flash forward 20 years um, later, 25 years, and we have the public charge rule, and this was in effect back then, by the way, as well. Um, and so the public charge rule now where we have a community health centers again, and I'm just so proud of Jane Garcia, and I was reminding her this morning how much she is my hero because she's once again the named plaintiff in one of the lawsuits, La, Clinic, La Clinica de la Raza versus Trump, um, one of the lawsuits that was part of in joining the, um, the action recently. So it's just very critical in terms of this issue for our community health centers, but also um, there is a lot of fear among community health centers as well as um, providers to this community, um, what impact there could be on uh, community health centers as well for, for this role that we are playing. Um, but I just greatly appreciate leaders like Jane Garcia for her bravery in terms of standing up on behalf of all of us. Um, also having done that at the California Endowment where they've also been leaders in Health for All and advancing that effort. So so this is near and dear to uh, communities, health centers of, in uh, statewide, and certainly CPCA um, has has stepped on this up on this issue. We've really had to, uh, in the context even nationally, uh, and this has really been a, a fact for California for many years on the immigration front, where California in the community health center movement has really been a leader for bringing these issues forward at the national level, including at our national association, the National Association of Community Health Centers. And on this particular issue, um, due to the expertise and the challenging political, cli political climate at the federal level, CPCA has actually played a leadership role nationally with all the community health centers in terms of being uh, in partnership with our national association as uh, the key place where people are coming to for resources. We're chairing a national work group on behalf of community health centers. The resources that we have created in toolkits for California are something that we've spread nationally in terms of providing that very um, critical education and support. So really, in so many different ways, uh, California is having to be a leader for our country on this when it comes to the policy and advocacy, the legal issues, the training, the education. Uh, so much of this is coming out of California, where I think we um, continue to be an important force on the national stage uh, when there is so much anti-immigrant climate um, that we continue to be the state um, that is pushing back. And, and so it's unfortunate our secretary couldn't be here today so that we could thank him, uh, certainly for all the leadership that our uh, state is providing on the issue. So I touched on some of the report findings about the effects of the shifting climate, including public charge policy on families and organizations. Um, I was wondering if you could each share some of your perspectives of what you're seeing directly um, through your lens, and also if you could comment on to, um, the degree to which um, the recent federal court ruling to block implementation of public charge has had any impact on how communities um, are being affected. And why don't we go back to Carmela to start? Okay. Well, certainly since the president's inauguration, this administration has been perpetuating policies that attack immigrant communities. And this um, proposed change to public charge rule is just one of them that has certainly ignited fears in our immigrant patients. Uh, and this really, uh, the, emer the leaking of the original emergency rule was, you know, uh, seems like years ago now. Um, and so this has been an issue that we have been grappling with for quite some time because of the beginning with the initial um, leaking is when the Im information got out there and began to further steer the climate of fear among our community. And obviously this public charge rule is a clear attack on our immigrant communities um, to discourage patients from utilizing public benefits that they have a legal right to and creating standards that will more likely lead them to become a public charge. So just more and more onerous policies. So of course we're thrilled that this nationwide injunction has been granted to halt the rule from being implemented on October 15th. Of course we hope this rule will never take effect um, and the court's order is protecting literally millions from lasting harm. And when I talk about lasting harm, I mean really um, when you think about flashback 25 years ago when this rule was in effect. And I remember when they uh, changed the policy and they uh, had a written notice to um, stop the public charge rule or basically very much narrow it. 
It felt like it took years for the fear and impact and the misinformation around that. To, it seemed like it took a decade um, for that to finally kind of dissipate. So we know from past experience that these, um, this harm is real and that the impact is lasting. Um, so now the judge concluded that the lawsuits challenging the regulation have a real chance of showing that the Trump administration has lacked, um, acted unlawfully when issuing the regulation. So um, very good sign. But because of this injunction, we want to be clear that immigrants can continue to receive their health care, nutrition, and housing programs to help them and their families thrive. Now that being said, uh, community health centers have certainly received um, anecdotal information that patients have been uh, canceling appointments and question whether or not to maintain their enrollment in public programs. Again, programs like Medicaid out of fear of deportation. Um, and so we know that there uh, is a chilling effect of these kind of proposed policies that keeps families from uh, staying in these programs or compelling them to disenroll. So we know from the survey results as well that there's been a, a, an actual impact. So we continue to be concerned um, that even when you have the injunction, uh, that there's still fear and even misinformation out there. So it's a tremendous victory for us for now, but yet the impacts are still being, effect, um, being felt in communities. Kathy, can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing? Sure, absolutely. And um, I mean, I think you're going to hear some echoes of each other probably throughout and from the, the presentation, because I think some of the themes are just so clear. And we sort of bring the perspective of being able to talk kind of on the ground about what our counties are seeing in the eligibility front. The, um, the Obviously, the fear and the chilling effect that it's having so much more broadly than even the individuals that we think sort of in our quick back of the envelopes would actually be directly affected by the public charge rule being applied to them as they adjust status or apply to come into the country um, are so much broader. And um, we've uh, definitely heard anecdotally, again, because the data are pretty hard to tease out, um, that in particular CalFresh seems to be the place that we're seeing the most withdrawals. Um, there are alternatives, sort of we try to think through why CalFresh, the, the hardest hit. There are alternatives for people where they don't ask your immigration status. You know, the local food banks are seeing a, a, an uptick in intake um, and requests for aid because um, they don't ask somebody to fill out an eligibility paperwork really in the same way. Um, and they like to know who they're serving, but not like that. They want to be a safe space. So definitely seeing that. And one of the things, um, we do know that um, San Francisco, for example, does keep track and try to do some data analysis Analysis. And in CalFresh, um, in particular, they've seen um, their immigrant population receiving CalFresh drop from, in December 2016, they represented 30% of the CalFresh caseload. Now in June 19, it was 24%. So the share of our immigrant recipients of the overall CalFresh population has dropped by six percentage points, which we think is significant as a decline. They've not seen um, a similar decline in Medi-Cal, actually, when you, look at, when you apply the same kind of numbers. We've actually seen the share of our immigrant households go up a little bit in Medi-Cal. And so our speculation on that is while any individual family might be calling and saying, I don't want to apply or disenroll me, um, there are fewer alternatives for medical care for our immigrant population. And so we think that that could be driving less of an overall withdrawal or overall um, chilling effect. I think what's really hard to measure in that regard, though, is how many people are eligible but not applying. And so, sure, it's a similar percentage of the people who are on the program, but how are we thinking about and, and how can we measure who is choosing not to apply? You know, it's sort of the, the negative. It's really hard to track that negative. And so um, we want to try to think about ways to partner with the state, and they're really thinking hard, especially at CDSS and at agency. How can we try to get at that? And I think it bears partnering with some of the folks who are doing the work, like you're seeing from the focus groups, to try to get at folks thinking and how can we work with them to understand that public charge is an immigration rule, but it hasn't affected eligibility. None of those rules have changed. Um, and I think we're going to talk a little bit in, in another question about the undocumented expansion, the new expansion, and how we might combat some of that um, as we think about rolling that out. I do want to say just also um, is the you know, this was already a trend, and I think, um, as Carmelo was saying, it goes back to that very first leak of the document. There was already a bit of a trend of people calling and asking for help and asking, am I still eligible? Would I be affected? Will I be deported? Will I not be able to get lawful permanent resident status? 
Um, and every single time there's been a flurry of activity, so the draft coming out, um, and then the proposed regs coming out, and then now the um, final regs coming out, and then coverage of the court case, you, we do get a little bump, again, anecdotally, of people calling. Um, my staff at CWDA, even though we are not direct service providers, have actually taken calls and fielded calls from people. And typically what we're doing is we're trying to get them to those legal services that are available and are posted on the CDSS website website, but there's that what they've told me is that for the majority of the people who have called us at the association, they're already lawful permanent residents. And so I think it just, you know, sort of adds to the misunderstanding and the confusion. And we believe, and I think most folks in this room probably believe, that that has been purposeful, that it's been purposefully confusing, that we're seeing so many changes and so many just um, things just heaped on so people think that it affects them even if it doesn't directly affect them. So that's, I'll stop there and, yeah. Uh, so the only thing I'll add or, or just as a blanket statement is that, you know, the damage is already done. That these policies, whether they go in effect or they don't, um, it's, it's happening in front of us. And that's what your data has told us. That's what our data has told us. I mean, the survey we conducted in partnership with the California Primary Care Association was in um, the summer of 27, 2018. And we were already seeing providers telling us uh, the damage that was being inflicted by this administration. And this was before the public charge rule was finalized, right? This was 90% um, of providers that, report, that we surveyed saw an increase in anxiety and fear amongst kids. 42% said that their appointments were getting canceled. 70% um, observed that the parents were anxious about doing everyday activities, like going to the park or taking their kids to school. Like that is um, happening right now in front of us, right? So our responsibility really is to think about what do we do to combat that? We've got all of these policies that on paper sound great, but what does that actually mean to the families in our communities? And thinking through, um, how do we combat all of the many different ways that this information is coming at people? Because we are living in this 24-hour news cycle, right, where we think, we as advocates, what do you mean? We did a blog about that. Didn't you read it? Right? But families are reading Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and, every, and radio stations and TV that, frankly, the information isn't always what we want it to say. And it, it's coming at them from all directions, so how can we make sure that through trusted messengers, through the spaces where they're at, that they're getting the information that they need to make those best decisions? Um, you know, I had the opportunity to sit on a, on a panel a couple of weeks ago with the, um, for the advisory committee of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. And they're doing, if anybody doesn't know this, they're, they're writing a report to the Department of Homeland Security on the impacts of immigration enforcement on children's education. Great. I didn't know that until I got invited to this panel. Um, which speaks to that there's all this information happening and how do we make sure that it gets channeled in the, 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 the right places. But I sat next to Esther Perales, who runs Next Door Solutions, which is a domestic violence shelter in Santa Clara County. And she was talking about the fact that they were seeing less and less immigrant women reporting domestic violence cases. And that they saw an obvious drop off in the attendance to their Spanish language support groups. She was very specific. It was Spanish language support groups that women were not showing up anymore. Maybe all of a sudden there was an incidence of domestic violence happening. Maybe. Let's, let's hope that that's the case. But more likely, it's that women are scared of what's going to happen to them as a result of that. You know, women or families are scared that what's going to happen if they, you know, show up to the clinic and ICE is in the parking lot. And that's what we're really seeing in this environment is that you're moving away from immigration enforcement that had its own problems under the previous administration. I won't say it was a perfect um, administration when it comes to immigration policy, but there are now deliberate efforts to enforce immigration policy that is damaging the well-being of kids and families, and that we as California have a responsibility to do all we can to push back against that. Um, and, and, and we'll talk about what that may look like, but I, I do think that a lot of our damage really is done. Uh, and I, um, one of our national partners did an analysis of Medi-Cal enrollment data and saw that 150,000 kids had dropped from the rules of Medi-Cal. People can use data in many different ways. You can tell the story that you want to tell. You know, some people are saying, well, our enrollment numbers really haven't dropped off. It's because our economy is so strong. 
we do not believe you. We believe that there is another story behind that, that your numbers, maybe someone drops off and someone new enrolls. Um, the fact of the matter is that through these stories that you have to give credit to, you have to believe the health centers that are reporting that people aren't showing up. You have to believe schools that are reporting that kids aren't coming to class, that those anecdotes are valid, important sources of data that convey that our families are frightened and that we need to do better. So I, um, if, if our secretary was here, I would tell him too, <laughs> that our numbers aren't always telling the accurate story and that we need to do a better job of getting into the ground uh, in order to, to reach families where they are. So we've got a lot, a, lot of, a lot more work to do, I think, to do that. And hopefully we'll talk about those solutions. Mm -hmm. So that's a great transition because let, let's try and um, move on to some of what's working in terms of solutions and helping families amid the shifting climate. So specifically, what are some ways you're seeing organizations and communities in California um, respond to the growing needs of families? And are there any actions or strategies that you think have been particularly useful or that you would highlight um, as innovative, innovative or promising practices? So why don't we start with Kathy this time? Hi, okay, great, thank you. So I'll talk about sort of what we've done at the association level to try to push information out, and then also um, what we know about some counties. Um, so again, I think I mentioned in my opening that we started doing some work to try to develop a toolkit with some of our uh, partners, including state partners and uh, statewide and then local kind of CBOs as a representative sample, and also joining the Protecting Immigrant Families Coalition, both in California and at the national level, has helped us shape um, a, what we just refer to as a toolkit that we keep on our website. It's cwda.org and you can type in immigration and then it'll pop up the, the link to the toolkit page. And it um, actually is worth, I think, looking at because it started out as a more general set of information. It was not really very specific to public charge, but more here is how eligibility works for immigrants for our programs. Because even the underlying rules set public charge aside are very confusing. Um, different visa statuses, different refugee statuses, the questions are not always asked consistently, there's extra forms that you have to fill out, and even understanding where does the data go can be very confusing for people. So we were trying to just answer basic questions about how do you do this, both for our eligibility staff and also for the general public. And then we definitely got more um, public charge heavy, I would say, in the toolkit as that um, became a real focus for us. And so there's information about the proposed rules and the final rules, um, links to comments and things like that. And then also, um, as much as we've been able to pull together from toolkits from other organizations. So there's still no one place. And Meyer, you're, it's a good point. It's so hard to find just sort of one clearinghouse. But we've tried to be eligibility specific and specific to our programs, but also try to provide a good basis of information and we update that regularly. I think um, one of the things that we've also seen and we just, this is timely because we just had a panel on immigration eligibility for benefits and working with our immigrant population at our conference two weeks ago and um, on that panel we had Alameda County, and I want to say that Anissa <coughs> Basoko Villarreal is here who uh, presented on our panel, and also San Mateo County presented. And we're happy, we're going to be posting those PowerPoints on our website, but we're, I also sort of culled a few pieces down that we're going to share as well to post on the event page. And so some of the things that Alameda County has done, and I encourage you to connect with Anissa on this, are to try to help um, provide some materials to folks when they come in, and also um, in lobbies and things like that and in conversations about what am I eligible for, what does this lingo mean, am I potentially subject to public charge, and help make the referrals that are needed to our outside partners that they can speak with about their specific immigration situation since it differs so much from one family and one individual to the next. Our eligibility workers cannot give legal advice. They cannot give immigration um, like specific advice to that one individual person, but can talk more generally about what people are eligible for and help them understand the pros and cons of taking up that coverage, especially you know thinking about health coverage when someone is ill or someone is pregnant or their children have a need. Um, so often what we're seeing is that the families that do call to disenroll from any of these programs, the children are citizens. And so they're, um, they're so fearful within the whole family that they're just sort of uh, disenrolling or pulling out or deciding not 
not to apply for benefits when they themselves or their children in particular are eligible and would never be subject to public charge, certainly, though could become vulnerable um, either act in actuality or in their minds um, given the uncertainty and the raids and the immigration approaches that we're seeing. So um, what we're seeing too is sort of um, flyers trying to help provide that information. Both um, Alameda and San, Fran and, um, San Mateo provided some uh, examples of that and certainly providing those in, in languages other than English, obviously, in threshold languages for each county um, to try to help folks understand across the, the different populations that could be affected by the rules and see that chilling effect. Um, I would just say, since um, CDSS is in here, I do want to give them a bit of a shout out. Um, they are really stepping up, I think, in their um, Immigration and Refugee Division to work with us and to work with other organizations like the National uh, Immigration Law Center. We're working with them to try to develop some additional and new training that can be pushed out to our eligibility staff in the counties. Um, uh, Gabrielle Lassard at NILC has done a great job and has gone into some individual counties, and so we're trying to build off of that. Um, and they uh, at the Health and Human Services Agency worked on a toolkit. I mean, I do want to say, um, and we'll kind of get into this, that some of the messaging that the state feels comfortable with our workers given, giving doesn't go quite as far as some of the advocacy organizations with regard to things like use of data and how much could we say sort of legally. And so we do really think that collaborating together is the critical piece to try to work together to send what messages our eligibility staff can send has been sort of worked out and negotiated at sometimes with the state but then also make sure that we're making those connections to legal services or to CBOs to try to help with that messaging as well because I think that sometimes they have a little more flexibility than we might. Myra, what are some of the successful strategies or innovations you're really seeing from? So I think first and foremost, the state of California has definitely put forward multiple efforts to try and combat what's happening at the federal level. I mean, we've got SB 54, which is the California Values Act, which is supposed to create safe communities. We've got AB 699, which is the Safe Schools Act, which is supposed to create welcoming and safe environments in schools for immigrant children. Um, we, the, the governor invested $25 million for work at the border, for increasing legal aid and making sure that uh, recent arrivals were receiving mental health services. Um, there's been a number of efforts, I think, to ensure that California is, is showing a different way, as Carmela said earlier. Um, I think part of the, the, the challenge has been implementation of these laws and how we're holding uh, our county partners, our, our local partners accountable to ensuring that they're implemented as the law intended. And, and, and that varies, right? That varies from resources and community, county to county. Um, and making sure that we're, we're living out the values that those laws intended in the first place. I do think that when we, when we try and think about what are successful models out there, you know, to your point, Samantha, about cross-sector relationships, that is really, I think, the, the most important takeaway that we had from our research uh, with immigrant families, like really thinking about how can we minimize the barriers that families have to go through to access the services that they need to meet the whole continuum of needs of, of themselves and their children. So you do have some important efforts that we want to highlight. You know, one is you know, the Mental Health Services Oversight and Accountability Commission for the first time put out funding to immigrant organizations, immigrant serving organizations to particularly meet the needs of immigrant communities. Um, that was thanks to the leadership of the state legislature working with the commission to make that happen. And it's a drop in the bucket, really. But hopefully, you're able to see what that investment has done and what it meant to the community so that next year we can go back to the legislature and say, this is what matters, and this is how our mental health dollars can respond. Um, similarly, with the public charge guide that Kathy had referenced that the agency recently put out, it's this great overarching, you know, what does public charge mean to HHS programs? that's at the you know, agency level. How can we use that to ensure that the departments, the divisions of the agency are actually sending out guidance to county offices? The Department of Healthcare Services in particular, that is particularly important and, and has not been as, as um, forthcoming with their positions uh, when it comes to the immigrant community. So I, I think really trying to get a little bit more granular with these high level initiatives that sound great 
but we really need uh, a little bit more accountability when it comes to implementation to ensure families on the ground benefit from that. And I, I want to give credit to organizations and partnerships that are, exist throughout the state that are bright spots in California. You know, when we talk about cross-sector relationships, we would really love to see uh, the medical legal partnership model expanded. Um, you've got, you know, the Peninsula Family Partnership. You have the Long Beach Children's Clinic. You've got UCLA Harbor. You have LA County and Neighborhood Legal Services. These are all entities that connect community health centers with legal providers, that there is uh, money invested into making that connection come alive. And that is what we really need to see in order to, again, minimize the barriers on families. So if a family is walking into a health center because they feel safe, they feel welcome, and that health center says, here is a lawyer you can talk to, that is so much of an easier process than to send the mom home and say, you need to talk to a lawyer, go find one. Like, think about the many barriers that families already have to go through in order to have that warm handoff and in order for that clinic to be incentivized to do that warm handoff. That is that making that con connection to services that much more possible. Project Dulce is a model that the First Five Association and various First Fives across the state have utilized in order to create these connections for families. Um, many times they're connected with a community health worker or a community liaison that allows that family to connect to those services in their language or based in their community. Again, that really highlights the importance of providing this, this um, whole continuum of care. And uh, you know, for the, the health advocates in the room, who think about you know, how can we transition or transform our healthcare system to better respond to our communities, there's been a lot of attention on whole person care, right? We're all whole people. Uh, when you think about whole person care, many of the models that have been initiated have focused on high need users, chronically homeless, people with multiple chronic conditions, people that are costing the system a lot of money. Well, what we're trying to argue as child advocates is that if you invest in children in a holistic way, you prevent them from becoming high need users. And frankly, many of the model, much of the model of a whole person care, there's like these um, basic elements, right? One is coordination of services. Another is integrating community voice, making sure the community is represented in the initiative. Uh, and then the, the third one is a community workforce. Those are the same elements that would benefit children as well. And if we can get in early and ensure that a family has the holistic continuum of services that they need, um, we can reform our healthcare system to do better and hopefully raise a healthier generation of children to become better and more productive adults. Carmel, are there solutions or strategies you would highlight? Yeah, I want to highlight one. I, I really agree with what's um, been said here by the speakers and Myra's point about the implementation of the policies. You can pass a law, but if you don't ensure standardization or if the implementation is sloppy, or if there's no implementation, um, then the, you know, it's worth the paper it's written on. So um, this, is, this is, I totally agree with that point. And so for the community health centers as strong supporters of the Values Act, which required, for example, specific, specified health facilities um, to establish policies that would limit enforcement, uh, immigration enforcement on their premises, it was also an omnibus anti-enforcement bill that focuses on limiting interaction by ICE and law enforcement. So this was a very important bill because it's specific to uh, community health center facilities um, to encourage facilities like FQHCs to establish policies that would limit uh, immigration enforcement on their premises. So we felt it was really important as the trade association representing our community health centers that we really look at um, why create hundreds of policies throughout the state. We need to have one policy that would work for our health centers, um, realizing that this not only had um, implications for California, but potentially nationally as well. So we, um, and it was actually the law itself required that the um, attorney general create and establish um, model policies that could be used. Um, so that was a really important part of the law as well, to require model policies. Well, CPCA had already been developing those policies uh, in concert, again, with our um, national uh, clinics across the country. 
And so we worked, uh, again, to encourage the Attorney General to release comprehensive policies and procedures that would actually match those created by CPCA that we had already put a lot of effort and legal work into, um, having created our own policies. And those were, uh, we did coordinate with the Attorney General's office on that. We've drafted six policies on a range of topics, including, for example, how to create your own waiting room as a private space, staff procedures for use during an ICE raid, uh, messaging protections in place to patients, uh, among others. So I think it's been really critical that we help our centers put these policies in place through toolkits that we make available on our website and also um, get out the word nationally um, to educate people as well. Um, about ICE and, and the rights that people have. And we'll continue to work with our immigration partners to track implementation of this bill. So again, just back to what's being said, it's important the uniformity and the education. I'll just give another example. We just talked about legal services. So at the time of rising national division, the policies passed in California include reinvesting general fund in legal services, really reaffirms our value and the importance. And like uh, it was stated by Myra, how critical this could uh, is for families, and it really sends a powerful message of inclusion really across the nation. Um, but then we do have the work to do to make sure that the legal information being given out is correct and uniform, and we actually need to make sure there's training of those providing the legal services as well. So it is a lot of work that needs to be done. And I totally agree with uh, Myra as well, what's being said about the benefits uh, when you're able to co-locate multiple kinds of social services to address the needs of these patients in a safe space. And uh, community health centers have been and will continue to be one of those um, arenas and really going uh, throughout the state, you really just see more and more um, the clinics are having to dedicate their resources to really trying to find ways to connect others to the community. And they continue to be challenged by the fact that this is not taken into account in our reimbursement. These efforts are all grant driven. Um, and on soft money, and so they um, continue to present a big challenge to the health centers, but uh, the need to continue to do them at greater and greater levels is there. Um, so I wanna combine our next two planned questions. Um, in terms of starting to look ahead and thinking first about the next year, or the shorter term, what do you think are really the key policy issues that are gonna be affecting families and service providers? And as part of this, can you speak a little to your thoughts on implementation of the Medi-Cal expansion to young adults? Um, and why don't we start with um, Myra this time? Um, so I, starting with the Health for All Young Adults expansion, I think it's really exciting that we're at this point where California is the first state in the nation to expand coverage to undocumented young adults up to the age of 26. And you know, huge kudos to the wide swath of, of, of advocates and organizations and counties uh, across the state that made that happen. Um, it's, but it's pretty frightening to think that we're gonna implement this policy in this environment that we're going to try and say this message of come and roll in coverage when all around them is, is this loud noise that, uh, well, be careful if you enroll in that coverage or mm, don't know what's gonna happen with your information. It, it's just a very mixed message. And I think that's on top of trying to enroll young adults who in and of, its, in and of themselves are a difficult population to ensure let alone um, young adults who are immigrants who may come from countries that don't have insurance, have you know, public um, social systems that don't necessarily know how insurance works. So really thinking about the, the unique challenges of insuring young, undocumented young adults. Um, you know, we're, we're proud, again, to be in coalition with our immigrant rights organizations and our health partners to figure out what, what is going to work to reach those communities and really think, um, what are some lessons from the expansion of, of the undocumented children, right? And one in particular is this idea that you can enroll people who are um, in emergency Medi-Cal now and be enroll them into full scope Medi-Cal. Great, the counties have agreed that they're gonna do that and I think that's um, tremendous. And then there's, there's still this other population that we don't know how to reach them, right? So it's like community colleges, is it like, what do they do on the weekends, uh, the radio? There's all these different ways that we have to try to, to get at people. 
Um, and a lot of it is also communicating to their family members. Like, can we get to their moms? Can we get to people that they know and trust in order to reach them? Um, which goes and speaks to the importance of community partners and serving as trusted resources of accurate information in order to reach them um, where they are. Uh, so I, I think it's a very exciting time, but also um, a little nerve wracking to think of what's, what's to come. Um, and in particular, you know, trying to think about the Department of Healthcare Services and what sort of communications they're putting out uh, to young adults or to you know, their enrollee population um, and thinking uniquely, are there certain materials that we could be cre creating? Um, shout out to the California Endowment who's been working on a, on a young adult specific uh, mechanism uh, of communication, whether it's a fact sheet or a specific script that works to communicate to young adults uh, in partnership with a number of organizations. Again, trying to get to people in a way that speaks to them in order to take advantage of this important benefit. Um, one thing as a child advocate that we consider is that immigrants um, are more likely to have children at a younger age. So really thinking about these young adults, maybe parents themselves, and that's a two-generation approach if we've ever seen it, making sure that that parent is insured um, will be that much more likely to have their child insured. So really thinking how can we reach those young moms or young dads in order to ensure that their children are also healthy. Um, so trying to be creative with what that might look like. And then I do think that you know, a lot of your recommendations, Samantha, from the research need to continue to be uh, put you know, front and center for California that over the last couple of years, so much of our work has been defense and pushing back against these federal policies that we have the opportunity to, again, show a different way and be more proactive in reaching out to immigrant communities and what does that look like in particular. Uh, and I'm excited to, to think about that, particularly under this governor. This governor has made important investments in our immigrant communities and in um, the health programs that support not only immigrant communities but Californians more broadly um, and, and thinking what we can do um, to build on those investments and make sure we have a more long-term sustainable um, investment in this community. Carmela, what are your um, policy issues that you're focused on for the coming year, and what are your thoughts on um, implementing that undocumented young adult expansion? Well, like Myra, I mean, she, the great comments, Myra, I totally agree with what you're saying. It's such an exciting um, opportunity, but yet we're going to have just major, major challenges. And so one of them um, that we're facing as healthcare care providers um, is the impact of these anti-immigrant policies fundamentally on, on our bottom line as um, providers, because one of the things that was a uh, true asset of the ACA is the way it really stabilized community health centers because of the Medicaid um, expansion that allowed for literally millions of patients that we had seen previously uninsured on the sliding fee scale to come under the Medi-Cal program, which for federally qualified health centers uh, is actually a very important important reimbursement stream, uh, unlike the low provider uh, Medicaid rates that private physicians have, the FQHCs have um, a more robust Medicaid rate that's more in line with the comprehensive services that they provide. Um, and so as people disenroll from Medi-Cal, that um, impacts the patient mix, and particularly if this public charge rule to, were to go into effect and uh, create more mass hysteria, I think, of fear around this, um, and I'm, I'm sure see more significant uh, disenrollment, it will have a financial a financial destabilizing effect on the safety net. That does need to be stated and something we are um, very concerned about and in tune with the, the payer mix and how it impacts a robust safety net. And this is on top of other um, policies that could have a potential devastating effect on community health centers that we are watching as well. For example, um, the, um, the state's uh, executive order on, on pharmacy and the um, transition that the governor is trying to do with um, lowering the cost of pharmaceuticals and using the weight of the state on purchasing is actually having a detrimental impact on the 340B program, which is a pharmacy uh, program for community health centers uh, the tune, to the tune of $150 million in services that we are able to provide um, due to this funding. So we have other funding challenges on the horizon as well that need to be addressed um, that could be compounded uh, if our uh, Medi-Cal is impacted. So those are certainly things that um, we need to be watching 
watching for, well, at the same time, um, we need to move forward in this environment of being that safe haven, safe space, and educating um, our constituency, as well as seeking to have as much standardization as possible in the procedures. And, and certainly working at the county level, I think, is really important. It was great to hear the examples out of Alameda and San Mateo County. But we need to make sure those kind of progressive policies are throughout the state, and it shouldn't matter which county you're in to determine whether or not immigrants will be receiving the information that they need from the counties. Kathy, is there anything you'd add? Well, I couldn't agree more with that and with what both of my colleagues here have said. I think um, kind of touching on a couple of the themes, it is both exciting and a little terrifying to think about this next expansion. I mean, from a nuts and bolts perspective, you know, information technology changes had to be made. Those are on track to be made. We strongly supported this expansion, um, would support the expansion to the older adults, to all adults, um, to the extent that those are undertaken in coming years. But we obviously are just doing this in such a different environment. And even in the initial expansion to the children, there was a lot of discussion already about how do we send the message and what are the trusted partners and how do our staff get trained with messaging around um, congratulations, you're now in full scope Medi-Cal. Okay, well, what the heck does that mean? And I was, I, where, where is my information being sent? So I think it's going to be really critical as we roll it out to make sure that we've both re-upped those messages and also expanded on them to answer questions that we know our staff are receiving about those types of questions. And there are answers to those. They're not always fully satisfactory, but there are some answers about, you know, um, for example, if you are undocumented and you're not saying that you have a satisfactory immigration status, we don't actually run at the eligibility level information through uh, USCIS. We don't go to the immigration service with your information because who we test out to ensure that the information comes back as a match is people who say, I have a visa, I am a refugee, I have LPR, and so we check their numbers and things like that. So we don't even get to that point with undocumented recipients and making sure that our staff know um, here's what happens when you type this information in and go, go. Um, CMS gets information about our undocumented recipients because we have to claim for the emergency services or pregnancy services, so the state has to share that information, but that's only for that purpose. USCIS gets the immigration check, but only for people who are not documented. And it's so confusing. It is so confusing to people about how that information might be shared. And I think one of the things that we've been worried about as well is you could say right now the feds have a policy in place that they don't share information behind the scenes, but they could change that policy. I mean, do we really trust this administration that's there now to not do that and maybe not even tell people? It's just such a changing environment. So we've got to be, I think, both really cautious about we, what we have our eligibility staff say but also really mindful of the concerns that are out there and how do we do things that um, make it less of a where am I living kind of question and more of a we're partnering across the state with, with our clinics, with our health centers, with our schools to try to make sure that the messages are there, that this is really important coverage to take up. I think the point about the young adults being a really tough um, crowd anyway, I mean, think about how much money Cover California spent on those young invincibles and trying to get them into coverage and still spend with all of their work. Um, there's going to be probably a lesser uh, take up rate and Medi-Cal already among folks who don't get sick all that often. And those are the young adults. And so making sure that they are getting the message that you're eligible now, you can get coverage, you can keep that coverage, and not just use it in an episodic way, um, and, but use it more as an ongoing service, a health home, prevention, and the kinds of things that we are trying to do with whole person care. Um, there's a lot of opportunity here, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done, I think, across all of our organizations to make sure that it's really realized. Great. So we're starting to cut into the Q&A time, and I want to give our audience um, time to ask questions. But if you could um, each just wrap up this session with just a few short words on longer term, what the priorities and focus is, um, so we can just have that longer term frame of reference as well before we shift to the audience. So do you want to start, Myra, and we'll just move down the line? Sure. Um, so one thing that we've been thinking a lot about is... <clears throat> Again, how do you frame these issues in a way that widens the tent of people that care? And right now, we are fortunate to have um, the first ever Surgeon General in the state of California who is focusing on adverse childhood experiences and who is shining a light on the impact of childhood trauma on the long-term development of children. 
And if you can't see immigration enforcement as trauma, you're not looking. <laughs> Your eyes are not open. And really trying to think about how can we frame this discussion from an early childhood development perspective in order to increase the awareness of these issues and the opportunity for us to respond in a proactive way to support our kids, all kids, right? Whether the kids that are coming over the border and are recent arrivals to those that have been here and who are traumatized by what they're hearing and seeing um, every day. So really trying to ensure that our early childhood workforce is aware of, of what they're seeing um, in their centers, that our educators are aware of what they're seeing. You know, research tells us that trauma manifests itself in many different ways, and it could be irritability. It could be aggressive behavior in the classroom. Uh, and rather than saying uh, that that child is, you know, a bad kid and he's going to get in trouble and, you know, then you're going to put him into a, a trajectory that could potentially ruin his life forever, really think about the environment that that child's being grown up in and what is being exposed to and how we can better respond and what can we do to support our early childhood providers, our teachers, our school administrators, um, that really uh, are critical uh, relationships uh, to children every day. Uh, because if there's anything that, uh, you know, my mentors in the mental health field and my people that inspire me in, in childhood development is that the most protective factor that we can give children who are exposed to trauma is a healthy relationship. So when we think long term, what is our responsibility? It's on all of us to ensure that children have healthy relationships, healthy supportive relationships that will support their healthy development. Uh, and I think that responsibility falls on, on each of us to take part in it. Kathy, just a few words. Sure. Well, first, you stole my talking. Trauma, uh, <laughs> ACEs, trauma. Um, I mean, I think it all boils down to that. There's a snowball effect, right? Um, that over time, as you are pulling out of programs, you're less able to uh, think for, in school. I mean, if you're, if you're ill, if you're hungry, you're ill prepared to learn. And we know that. And I do think it comes back so much to the children and to the families who are in this constant barrage of fear. I, I look back at your slide, you know, the, your second slide of all of the people and all of the things. And it's all bombarding that, that person, that family in the middle and all of the things that they're having to deal with right now. There's no question, but it's going to end up with um, a, a generation of children um, and their parents traumatized and ironically seeking help from the very system that I think the administration in Washington is actually trying to drive them away from. They're gonna need our help more than ever. And so making sure that we are able to talk about that with all of the service providers, with all of the folks in our system and the behavioral health system, like you said, in schools, in clinics, our health providers, and be able to really share that message. And I think come back to that question of how do these uh, adverse childhood experiences and trauma affect them on an ongoing basis um, and just help try to figure out a way to restore just their long-term ability to thrive and live and be productive happy to the greatest extent possible adults with those relationships in mind it's the, exactly the, the the same answer so yeah. sorry but <laughs> yeah, I think it's so so clearly the answer and Carmela just to close us out here <laughs> Well, sorry, but I have to get on my soapbox. We're going to talk about trauma and mental health because, um, unfortunately, federally qualified health centers continue to be the least leveraged entity available to address this issue in the state of California. I told you we're serving 7 million patients. Under federal law, we're required to provide mental health services or, or at least a referral thereto. But currently, under state policy, we cannot provide a mental health and primary care visit on the same day, nor can we bill for MFTs, even though the legislation passed a few years ago. There are some low-hanging fruit solutions here in the provider of choice to this population that are not being maximized. Now, that, those policies are for the Medi-Cal program, but if we could see MFTs and Medi-Cal bill same day, it's only going to um, enhance our ability to provide Medi-Cal services for everybody. I mean, mental health services for everybody, including this population. I will say another place where it's completely underutilized and under resources is with respect to the Mental Health Services Act. We talked about county by county how things are different. 
No place is that more clear than with respect to this law where when it comes to prevention and early intervention, which is really a way to get at this trauma ahead of time, um, we don't have access to those resources in most counties in the state of California. Community health centers are not being leveraged. So I just have to say that because I think it's such a critical issue and that we're sitting on resources and providers that could be better maximized, I just have to say, is a major source of frustration for me. Now that being said, um, when it comes to community health centers, we want to continue to reassure everyone that our patients will, re and our, we will remain a safe space for everyone to seek services and um, are, co are co committed to seeing everyone, including our immigrant population, regardless of their status. And we're gonna continue to play a leadership role in educating our patients and providers on this rule and the devastating impact it has. And we'll continue to do that at um, both the local, state, and national level. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it back over to Carolyn. Um, we'll run our Q&A. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, so we're going to have Samantha rejoin. So in case folks have questions for her about the research, she gets to answer questions, too. Um, so if folks do have questions, just come on up to uh, We've got a standing mic here. Um, feel free. Good morning. Good morning. This is tremendous and we're so grateful I speak for everyone here which I don't know why I would do that but anyway speaking for That's everyone okay. here I'll, we'll take it uh, <laughs> yeah we're, we're extraordinarily grateful for this I have two questions the first one is beginning roughly in November moving into December we're going to start seeing census takers rolling mm -hmm. into the neighborhoods um, we're not certain how that's going to impact whether it's going to worsen the situation or not. And I would be very interested in your opinions. Secondly, um, representing the hospital industry to some degree, um, I would also ask what do you think hospi hospitals can be doing, particularly those in the safety net, um, as the providers of last resort, what we can be doing to um, better help um, address some of these issues. Thanks. Um, I'd like to speak. Thank you for raising the census, actually. I really appreciate that um, because it is so critical that we have this educational effort within our community in part you ask a very good question, what's going to happen when census people come out in this kind of climate? Well, we're going to find out. Um, and uh, do, do expect that it'll be a, another source of confusion and fear within uh, our communities. And because of that, um, CPCA is playing a lead role working with our clinic associations and the health centers in the state to do an educational initiative around the census. And working with the um, uh, Secretary of State's office around those efforts as well uh, is really critical. And really this is part of uh, a realization that the community health centers really need to be doing more. We have access to seven million patients, seven million people who truly need um, those educational efforts. So I will tell you that um, we've woken up to this fact and the California Primary Care Association is embarking on a major advocacy plan that includes a much stronger engagement of our uh, membership and of the patient population. So starting with the census and another key area as well is actually voter education with an initiative led by Altamed Health Services who's actually been able to demonstrate with data that when you have uh, frequent touch points from a trusted a uh, nonprofit, in this case it happens to be Altamed as a service provider, that you can get um, people who tend to not vote to actually vote. So um, I think these are a couple of areas, census and voter education are really just the beginning of a much stronger effort that we need to do to reach our patients and educate them. Thank you for asking. Um, and just to follow up on that, I think much of the coalition that work to ensure that we're protecting immigrant families, um, this wide diverse array of immigrant organizations, children's advocates, health advocates, schools, um, is that same coalition that's going to participate in a census education campaign uh, because the people that are most impacted are the very same people that are most impacted by the changes in policy, um, by cuts to programs, by the confusion. And I, I don't think we should kid ourselves that this is intentional. You know, one of the, on the slide that Samantha put that had all of the different ways in which immigration policy changes, you can add citizenship question on the census to that list. Uh, and it really is an intentional effort by this administration to not count black and brown people. 
And if you don't count black and brown people, you will have less numbers to determine the level of resources to the very programs that support low-income families across the country. You know, school lunch programs, SNAP, Medicaid, uh, housing assistance programs, they all depend on the census count. So when you don't count low-income families or you don't count people of color, uh, you have less resources going to states like ours that really require that. $76 billion in California is at stake because of the census. Um, so if you're not working on the census, come talk to any one of us, and I'm sure we can get you involved to make sure that every person is counted, and in particular, every child is counted. Young children are the most undercounted population in the country. Um, so there's a lot of confusion about, do I count my, 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 my baby in the womb? Do I count a month old baby? There's a lot of confusion about that and making sure we reach, we reach families where they are. And then to your question about hospitals, you know, one of the recommendations, we, we had five overarching recommendations from our research, and one of them was in particular building the capacity of providers to respond to this environment. Um, so you know, our immigrant rights organizations have been masterful at know your rights trainings, so that you can know your rights as a hospital about when ICE can come onto the property or when they cannot. And they're being tricky now, wearing you know, plain clothes, not necessarily ICE jackets. So making sure that our hospitals are allies in this work based on the law in order to protect their, their, their patients. Could I address the hospital question too, just a little bit? I don't represent the public hospitals and health systems, but do a lot of work in partnership with them and thinking about the safety net question that you asked. I think what we've seen has been a movement to try to be the provider of first resort, especially driven by the whole person care initiative that you mentioned, Myra, as well as some of the um, other parts of the existing 1115 waiver that DHCS is now working on a process to renew. Um, CalAIM is what that's going to be called, and it was just released publicly today. So you might go look at sort of their starting point for what is going to be in the waiver. I know that in particular the public hospitals are facing, and this is the number they have used, um, a whole of about $2 billion across the various pieces that would not continue as part of this waiver, which is obviously really significant for them. So we're trying to help partner um, with all of the county providers and the county family that we're a part of, but in, in particular the public hospitals and health systems to think about how we can maintain and preserve both through the waiver as well as what it would have to be done outside the waiver to help them think about being that health home, that place of first choice. Um, and I know they do a lot of that in partnership with the local clinics as well. So um, I think it behooves us to think about that and work together. Um, I obviously am not as versed on the sort of private side, but um, just wanted to sort of point that out and also mention that that CalAIM uh, materials did come out today, I believe. So look at the DHCS website if you're interested in that. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Anissa Basoko Villarreal. I'm the Alameda County Policy Director for Social Services Agency. Um, so first I wanted to comment, Ms. Alvarez, I couldn't agree with you more that um, we as a county hope for more direction from CDSS so that it doesn't specifically come from counties. So couldn't agree with you more. Um, if any one of you can specifically maybe point to any policies or bills or proposals uh, that didn't get past this last legislative session um, and that maybe are now two-year bills uh, that you are supporting or any proposals that are maybe up and coming that we should support. Thanks. Carmela? Yep. SB 66, same-day visits is now a two-year bill. That is something that needs to move forward at some point sooner rather than later. We were strongly supporting, and I think it came through a different, couple different ways, so I don't have the bill number off the top of my head, and I did mention the um, further expansion to the aged population of undocumented, um, and I think there was a discussion around sort of can't we just make everybody eligible. Obviously, those are costs to the state um, because um, we, we would cover all of that, but um, areas to explore, and I expect you'll see them come back if it, not in a bill through the budget. The other one that we got really engaged with was AB 163 by Assemblywoman Garcia, which was held up in the appropriate Appropriations Committee, and my understanding is she won't be pursuing it in the coming year, um, but is talking to some other offices to see. And what this did was to try to get a role for the state and counties to play with regards to the centers that are housing children who are separated at the border. We've been really um, upset about this population. I would say CWDA got really involved in this bill to try to help shape it in a way that could be effective. Um, 
you know, the feds can just say no thanks when you try to come in, but trying to designate in the way the bill did a liaison between the state uh, licensing agency and the particular um, uh, homes that are um, holding these children and ostensibly serving them, um, they're licensed by the state. So there is a bit of a foot in the door that we can get um, that may be outside of that federal policy. Um, I'll just say I did, uh, I, I was lucky enough, I'm sorry for the, the diversion, to go to the border in El Paso about a month ago and spend a day there both touring with um, Customs and Border Patrol and ICE and then also going over to Juarez to see um, a federally, Mexican federal government funded facility there. And um, it is such a humanitarian crisis that I feel like doing what we can here in California with the with the children who are here and there are a fair number of them, um, even if we have to kind of edge our way in and kind of shoulder our way in to get those children connected to services is really critical. So we're hoping that that comes back in some way. And the only one that I'll add is a bill that actually died, which was a bill that would connect families to services using technology. So this is the idea that how do you open the door wider to services for families? Right now, if a family is eligible for Medi-Cal and they're eligible for food stamps and they're eligible for WIC, we make them fill out three applications. Mm -hmm. Why? There is no logical reason why. <laughs> so how can we make sure that in a state like ours that is home to Silicon Valley, we have the opportunity to modernize our system so that government works for families? So we had a bill that specifically would take WIC enrolled children and would automatically enroll them in Medicaid, and it died. So we are uh, exploring ways in which we can advance that initiative moving forward. There's a number of technology advancements that are happening that we want to be mindful of and, and give credit to and, and time to, to shape up. Um, but is there a way that California can make a commitment to minimizing the hoops that people have to jump through in order to access the services that they need to raise healthy kids? Hi, my name is Juliana Morgan Trosel. I'm a lawyer at Bay Area Legal Aid in Contra Costa County. Um, it's great to just see so many people in the room from different sectors working together on the same issues. Something that I'm really curious about is being able to reach populations who are actually not seeing, um, who aren't coming through our doors. And Kathy, you know, I think there's a reason when you mentioned that the calls that you've been getting are mostly from lawful permanent residents. Um, like generally we see people coming in who already know that they have a legal need. You know that their problem can be addressed by a lawyer who um, may be more proficient in English. Um, and so I really wanna figure out how to focus on the populations who, for various reasons, just aren't accessing services. So for the past two years, I ran a medical legal partnership serving Spanish-speaking um, survivors of interpersonal violence at a small health center in Contra Costa. Um, and so I think that my organization and I also have an acute sense of what the needs are in these populations um, and also what can be addressed through kind of cross-sector collaborations between legal and healthcare, also with education, um, with county welfare offices. The problem, like the report said, it sounds like is really the sustainability piece. And I think that's a particular problem in the cross-sector um, partnerships because it's like no one organization or sector is really in charge of it. So I'm wondering if you have kind of advice about how to um, ensure that there is sustainability in these kinds of initiatives and if you've seen examples of that happening in California. I mean, I'll just say that CDSS obviously has been probably the leader and has received the resources to try to develop um, resources for immigrants that are not just public charge related but have started, you know, a long time ago. And then now it, that's been boosted through the budget to try to do additional specific training on public charge. But we obviously need a ton more of that. It doesn't cover the whole state. Um, we've tried to work, like, on our talking points and information. Um, we tried to provide general hotline numbers for those counties that don't have a specific legal advocate um, and who maybe have less of a need, too. I mean, the smaller counties, you know, it's more rare, so maybe a state, statewide hotline. But there's no question that there's more that needs to be done. I think we were all at that press conference when the governor and the attorney general announced the... Um, the lawsuit on public charge, and um, I actually hassled the governor for more resources on this um, in the press conference. So um, I think we really need to redouble those efforts, but also work together with folks who are on the ground doing this to see, could we build on those medical legal partnerships to do some things with counties, for example? Um, I don't know how much of that is done, but we could look into that and think about that um, so we have a better referral mechanism and maybe a partnership that could even be there. I know it depends largely on the county and there are some that probably wouldn't be able to get the ability to do that in parts of the state, but about a number probably would that may have not thought about that or looked at that as a model. So I think that would be something we'd be happy to partner with on because I think it's really needed. 
And, um, and Julian, I'm happy to talk to you more offline, but I, I think it is the time, uh, we are past time to really consider our Medicaid program and if it's accurately meeting the needs of our most vulnerable. And what can Medi-Cal do to better respond to non-traditional health needs that frankly impact health much more than going to a doctor's office, right? So how can Medi-Cal start to pay for some of these services um, through a state plan amendment, through our Medicaid waiver? Uh, you know, much of the conversation around the CalAIM proposal that Kathy mentioned is not gonna focus on kids. It's likely going to focus on behavioral health integration and high need users. Fine, do that. But if you can support the model of care of connecting these you know, seemingly unconnected services like health and legal, can that actually also translate into other areas of care delivery for vulnerable communities? Um, so I think we need to challenge our Medi-Cal program to better respond to families. And we have a secretary who has worked in these communities, who has experience in, with these models, with promotoras, with community health workers, with medical legal partnerships. How can we challenge them to, to do more in, in this time right now? And I think to your issue about you know, how do we reach people that haven't come in, uh, we think about that every day. And uh, I, I need to give some credit to our ethnic media who is doing their best to write about these stories in language, who are you know, on the radio talking about public charge. And those of us in the room who have gone on the radio for five minutes, that five minutes is important. So if, if you get an asked by an ethnic media reporter to speak, take five minutes from your day and do it because it's such an important form of communication to families who may not go to their county office, may not go to a health center and need to get this information and know that these services are available to them um, and it's their right to access them. So we are right at time. So I wanna be respectful of time to see if there's any last word on this collaboration. Yeah. Um, I would just also say for, in terms of philanthropy, I think philanthropy is playing a very important role of both. I love it when I see the blogs from major philanthropy entities and CEOs. I think that's wonderful. Also the funding, um, but also it's a, <laughs> such an opportunity to invest in the small nonprofit or fledgling sometimes that we don't invest in historically. Latino-led, immigrant-led, nonprofit organizations that are doing the work on the ground, they're not getting the big bucks. And this is really an opportunity to invest in them and their capacity. Yep. We agree with you, Carmela. Um, <laughs> we definitely do. Um, so I wanna, I wanna be very sensitive to time and know that folks have taken a big chunk of their, their morning to be with us this morning and to say thank you for that. A few of the key themes I just wanna highlight because we all sit in different spaces, right? Each of you come to this room from your roles and your positions and, and what you can influence. And it sounds like this is something that from a response perspective, it's big enough that all of us really do have a role in, in being able to be a part of our, our responsibility to respond here. So the few things that I heard, partnering for services. So we heard about medical legal partnerships. Also in the report that I would just highlight to check that out because there's some really innovative partnerships even beyond med legal as well, um, bringing in behavioral health, mental health services with, with attorneys as well. So some great models there. Partnering for reach was another thing that I heard a lot around you know, um, government agencies may be able to say so much, but CBOs and advocates can say more, right? So how do you leverage your own positioning and what you can say and who you have a reach to to really make sure that we reach these folks that are not, not calling or not coming forward necessarily for help? Um, the third piece being really accurate information through the channels that people are already going to for information, right? And so part of that is the reach. And then the last big theme around consistent implementation of, of laws, both to support, as CPCA has, with, with policies, um, but also to hold accountable, right, for consistent implementation. So we heard Kathy mention a few Shining Star counties around how they've been doing this work. Um, how do we ensure that that's really more consistent across the state versus sort of anecdotes or, or bright spots, right? How can we have more of those bright spots? Um, so with that, uh, I want to just say thank you again, everyone, for coming here for braving blackouts and fires mm -hmm. and smoke to make the time to be here this morning. Um, I think some of our speakers may be sticking around for a little bit if folks have questions, but also just really do encourage you to check out the report, which has also some more interesting information about cross-sector models, in particular in San Diego. I think that would be really interesting to check out. Um, Samantha, as my co-host, anything you would add? Uh, no, I just wanted to thank you all for oh, 
I just wanted to thank you all for sharing your time with us this morning um, and for focusing and caring about these issues um, and reiterate what Carolyn was saying is that I really just touched the surface of the findings in the report and there are many more details available in the written report. We have um, printed copies available today and then it's also available on our website. So I would encourage you to check that out for, um, for more detailed information. But thanks again and thanks to our great panel um, for sharing their expertise today. Yeah, thank you very much.